and we're now recording. So thanks everyone for coming to our second of three Pressbooks Publishing Pathway trainings for the Open Textbook Network Publishing Cooperative. Today we're going to talk about building a structured textbook in Pressbooks. Um, but before we get started, I just want to share two related resources with you. The first one is the Canvas module that Liz developed all about Pressbooks that's now a part of our Open Textbook Publishing curriculum. So if you would like to refer to uh, support materials for some of the things you're learning in these three meetings, you can find it there. And then I also put in a link to these recordings. So right now there's one in there. And I think uh, a Pressbooks info session from a couple years ago is probably also in that playlist with Liz. So um, this will be a dedicated playlist to all things Pressbooks. And you'll find today's video and next week's video at that link. So last week we got an overview of what Pressbooks can do. We saw some examples of completed books and we took a quick look under the hood, including uh, seeing a brief demo of cloning. And I am excited, we got a question from Barb, who um, many of you see in the call as 1001780, but that's Barb. Um, and she has been experimenting in the sandbox that's a part of this training, and she gave a shot um, to cloning a textbook. And she had a question that I had a chance to forward to Liz and Steele, and so they're going to demo cloning. Then, a few moments later, Barb actually said, wait, I figured it out. So I think what would be fun is um, Liz and Steele can kind of talk through um, the question as, as I forwarded it from Barb's email, and then we can ask Barb, is this how you did it, or perhaps you did it a different way? So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Liz Mays. As a reminder, Liz is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Pressbooks, and Steele Blackstaff, who's also here with us, is the Educational Client Manager and Product Owner for Pressbooks. I will be managing the chat, but other than that, I hand it over to our Pressbooks friends. And Steele is actually going to kick us off today. We want to make sure not to make anyone dizzy with uh, frequently switching screen shares. Um, so, and in general, the short answer to the question conceptually is that there are quite a few ways to import things into Pressbooks, and the best way depends on the source you're coming from and the goals you have for um, that book in Pressbooks. And I'll let Steele speak specifically to that and demonstrate some of the options as he's talking. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know exactly the method that was used, but I will show uh, in a second, let me pull that up, um, a couple of different ways that tech, the content can be imported. So um, suppose we have a sample book. Um, let me find one here. Uh, Um, okay, I've got a screen to share with you. Now it's ready. Okay, so here's a sample book here that I found that was published with Pressbooks. And this is Liz Mays edited this one, so I know it's safe to share. Um, this is a guide to making open textbooks with students. And it lives at this URL, and it has an open license. The first and most common way if it's already in Pressbooks is simply to take the URL, come to your target that you want to bring it to, and click clone a book. Enter the URL, say where you want it to live on this new network, and then click the clone it button. When that happens, the whole book and everything with it will just get copied. So there's no granular choosing there. It's just, I brought the whole thing over and now the whole book is there. And once it's there locally, then I can destroy and revise and edit and do things with it there. Another way that you can do it though is to say, well, let's say I wanna pick and choose from this book. So I can take that same URL if it's in Pressbooks and actually say tools import. And there's a bunch of different import options. So this is, these are most commonly used if you have documents that were made somewhere else that weren't Pressbooks, but there is also a web page or Pressbooks web book option. So you can, up, you can add a file or give it a URL. So in this case, I'm gonna do the same thing except I'm gonna import with this URL. And hopefully what will happen here in just a second, you'll see, ah, Here's the book that you've just selected. Which parts of this book do you want to bring in? If you don't want the whole thing, I can select all and say, okay, here's what it's recognized. Here's everything that we thought was in the book previously, and we're, good, we're gonna grab it and bring it in. And then I could say, you know what, but I don't want this chapter, 
or this chapter or this chapter or this chapter or that chapter. And then I would say import those selections. So that's a different way that you can import just using the URL. No files were involved there. All I needed was a public press book that had an open license and there was a cloning and the import. A third method, if you really want to get in the weeds, is to say, if the book has made the XML available, you can download the Pressbooks XML. And then from the import routine, let's go back a step. Again, I come to, I have a shell book. Let's say I've got an empty book. Let's pretend this is an empty book in your sandbox. This is pretty empty. So I would say tools, import, and then I would choose XML as my choice. And in this case, I'm gonna take my file, bring it in and say begin import. And you'll see a very similar screen to what you saw before, where you can pick and choose individual pieces of the book to import at the time of import or cloning. Um, and so the answer to the question was, the, the, the user did 1001780, or I think it's easier. They said they used the tools and import method, except instead of, excuse me, instead of, I'll go back a step. Okay, let's cancel this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, instead of actually adding the URL of the book, they put the URL for the index page on the OTN library which of course is just an HTML page describing the book rather than the book itself. And so that's why they didn't find the content. It was at one URL removed, I think. So Barb, great question. And hopefully that answered that uh, question. Is that, is that everything we wanted to hear or see at the beginning related to import and cloning? Okay. Thanks, Barb. Okay. So the thing that I wanted to start with actually before I get into like the hands-on and building and structuring book is to talk a little bit at a higher level theoretically about two things that are pretty important to us and probably will be important to you and your contributors. And those are accessibility, both for platform and content, and internationalization, or being able to localize content based on different languages uh, and preferences of the user. So the first thing is that at Pressbooks, accessibility is really important to us, primarily because we, we want to make an authoring tool that's available to as many people in the world as possible. We would like, if it's an open source software tool and it should be open to creators, it should be open to all different kinds of creators, different labeled creators and people that are encountering the internet in lots of different ways. And that means generally for software platforms, there's a set of WCAG guidelines. It's WCAG 2.0 AA, the, the kind of web accessibility guidelines. These are a set of kind of overall guidelines that say, is the tool and is the content accessible according to agreed upon internet standards? And so at Pressbooks, we have both an accessibility, or I'll start by saying we have an accessibility policy, which we're proud of and we think is important. So it's like, it's like an aspirational statement. Uh, and I can drop this in the chat if you'd like to read it and give us feedback on it. Um, here's the accessibility policy. And so what we've done in the past has worked really closely with people who are more accessibility experts than we are. The place we've worked most closely is OCAD University in Toronto. They have the Inclusive Design Research Center. Some of you may know Jess Mitchell. She's pretty well known in the community and uh, works there at the IDRC. They helped us and did a full kind of, um, we hired them to do an audit of our platform. And at the end of that, we produced what's called a VPAT or a Voluntary Product Accessibility Template for the authoring interface. If you're interested in knowing more about that, Liz wrote a little, I think Liz wrote, maybe, I, just kidding, I wrote this, I thought it was Liz, a blog post talking about our VPAT, and Liz has linked the actual VPAT itself. So you can read about like, at the technical level, all of the different standards for accessibility, and how Pressbooks as an authoring platform complies, or partially complies, or, or where we're at in relation to accessibility. So we worked really hard on making our platform and the tool itself accessible so that people with different levels of uh, sight or other kinds of access issues can still use Pressbooks to create content, whether they're navigating with the keyboard or using a screen reader or other forms of assistive technology. We also, in our guide, have a brief chapter where we talk about accessibility and universal design. Um, there's, th these are very large topics that are full professional domains, so we don't this is not exhaustive, but we talk about some things that we've done structurally at Pressbooks, where 
we try to make sure that the HTML markup is clean and semantic. The PDFs, uh, we make tagged accessible PDFs. When you make eBooks, also the underlying structure should be clean and well-formed. And then we've also talked about some things that we've done to make Pressbooks more accessible for users and give some suggestions for resources that can be helpful. Um, in particular, I wanna show you some things that are available to users from their user screen. So once you're logged in as a user, if you click in the top right, or if you're not clicking keyboard navigate, you click edit my profile. Every individual user can choose some settings that customize their experience in the Pressbooks interface. For example, you may not like the visual editor and might prefer to be working with pure HTML. You can disable the visual editor. You might want to see syntax highlighting when you're writing in code. You can turn that on. We also have a couple of different color schemes. So you'll notice we have this red, gray, black color scheme. We've also made an accessible, we call it an accessibility color scheme. You'll notice when we switch to this, we're no longer using red as a color. It's just, it's, it's a much higher, um, contrast level, so the contrast between whites and darks are even higher, so it's a higher standard, and every link in the interface is now underlined for greater visual distinction and differentiation. So users can choose which color scheme they prefer. This one was specifically built with extra accessibility in mind. And then you can also, keyboard shortcuts are enabled by default, but if a user wanted to turn them off, they could. And if your Pressbooks network has installed other languages, the user can decide what language their interface shows them. So uh, as for example, suppose I'm a Francophone, I need a French speaker. On this network, we have the French language pack turned on for Pressbooks so that as an end user, I could say, I want to see everything on Francais. So if I were to save my settings here, you'll notice that the whole Pressbooks interface now is presenting everything in pop as everything that's possible to me to present in French because we've provided a French localization file here. Um, I could also say use the site default or use English or whatever languages your network manager has installed for the platform. Um, and so those are a couple of things that are available for both internationalization and or accessibility on the platform level. Another thing that may be helpful is you can navigate through everything by keyboard, right? Which takes a long time. Sometimes it's helpful to just see a site map so we have at the, in the bottom of your admin interface, you'll also see a sitemap link. And the sitemap will then show you, basically in a link form, all of the menus that are available to you as a particular user. And so that's sometimes helpful to see everything that's available from your admin interface in one single view. And so that's another mode of navigation if navigating these drop-down menus is cumbersome or difficult for whatever reason. Um, the second thing that we want to talk about was internationalization. So Pressbooks as a code base, our basic code base and all of the native, the, the native language for Pressbooks was English. But Pressbooks is headquartered in Montreal, it's Quebec, it's Francophone country. And, and um, we have many users in Francophone Canada and elsewhere that wanted the Pressbooks interface to be available in their native language. So uh, eCampus Ontario helped sponsor a professional translation project. So Pressbooks is fully available in French now. And we also support um, volunteer community translation from any other language that you can imagine. So we use a little tool called TransFX in case it's interesting to know. And all of our projects, the open source ones, are available here. And you can see the different languages that Pressbooks has been translated into, either partially or, or fully. If this is something that's a passion or a talent of yours or someone that you know and you want to contribute to an open source project, we're always interested in volunteer uh, translators to help improve the coverage of Pressbooks in languages that we are, as staff don't speak. So that's a fun, cool way to get involved in open source projects, even if you don't have coding skills, if you have language skills, they're really needed and they help internationalize a project. So that's what I wanted to say there. Um, the, the, in terms of jumping into the specifics for a book though, I want to then talk about some tips and ideas that you sh can and should use when you're making content in Pressbooks if I find my right page. Okay, so here we're back in the book editing interface. So if you have a, a test book in a sandbox, um, you can come to your book dashboard. And once you're at a book dashboard, you'll see a menu that looks like this. From the organized menu, you'll see all of the different chapters in your book. 
So I'm going to start editing a chapter that someone else presumably has started. So my colleague Bashak has started to write about the Hagia Sophia, which is an incredible building that I'd love to visit one day in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and so here's a bunch of text that she's put in. So when we're working with large blocks of text, it's often helpful to have text structure. And so you can see this appears to be uh, some kind of organizing text. And right now, Bashak has just indicated it should be organized by making it bold. Well, we may decide, you know, rather than bolding this, it makes more sense to apply a structural heading. So we would strongly recommend as you're writing your document in Pressbooks, thinking about either a style guide or some repeating structural patterns that follow a kind of logical sequence. So for example, if this is a top level heading, let's make this heading one. So I've, I've, what I've done here is I've selected the text and then I've applied a heading class to it. If I scroll down a bit further, you'll notice, okay, here's another little heading block that again, she just marked by making bold. So I'd select that text and I'd say that's another heading one. This little block here, it looks like it's probably a second level heading. So I'm going to apply heading two there. If I come down further, that looks like it's parallel with the one above it. So let's make that a heading two. And maybe this is a heading three, for example. So what I've done here, uh, just by way of demonstration, is I've said I've started to impose a predictable structure on the book. This is really strongly advised for accessibility. It's also important that if you start using headings, that you don't skip over them, that you use them in sequential order. This will be helpful for anybody who's trying to navigate this document with uh, assistive technology. So if you use a heading one, don't suddenly jump down to heading four. If you use heading one, the next heading, heading down should be H2, H3, H4, etc. And then you can use them in parallel or in a kind of structured, ordered way. So that's that heading tool. Another thing that we'd recommend considering doing would be using some of the built-in text boxes. So for example, we might say at the top of this chapter, I, I want to put some learning objectives. And maybe I want to move this overview into this section. So I'd say overview. And then the overview is going to have maybe just this opening paragraph. So I could replace that text in here. Um, and those are some other ways that you can structure and organize your text. Uh, the, the other things to, OK, so Karen says, um, oh, so Katie asked, if you import a Word document with heading structures, those translate into Pressbooks, right? Well, the answer, I think, is a little bit, it depends. It depends on how the headings were created. Um, if you use the built-in Microsoft Word tools, all heading ones will be brought into Pressbooks as chapters. So we will recognize a heading one and think, oh, you mean this is a new chapter. So if you have a really long Word document with a bunch of H1s or heading ones, Pressbooks will say, we think that you meant to bring those in as separate chapters. Um, if you wanted to include headings in a Word document that get respected as headings in Pressbooks, there's a method to do that using shortcodes. Um, and maybe I'll save that for the very end if that's still of interest, because it's a little bit of a more of a deep dive. But I will just say the answer to that is in our guide. Um, I'll just show you the guide chapter and say for headings and subheadings, if you were to write this in your Word document, shortcode heading and the shortcode heading, what would happen would be when it was imported, Pressbooks would say, ah, oh, this is supposed to be an H1 and turn it into an H1. And if you write subheading, it would turn it into an H2. So you can bring H1 and H2s into Pressbooks just from a Word document via import using these shortcodes. The, the lower down headings, not so much. Um, you'd have to recreate those or uh, there's probably some workarounds, but it's a little bit in the weeds. Um, and Karen talked about how this is a good idea to let people understand how information is hierarchically structured. Um, where was my chapter, though? I lost myself. Okay, great. Um, you're welcome, Katie. So let's say we produced this first little bit of content, and now I want to view the chapter. And I'll say, okay, um, here's my H1. If I come down a bit further, this is an H2. Here's my H3. Okay, I can see how the document's beginning to be structured here a little bit. The other thing to note is when I want to control and change the styling, it's generally pretty important in web development or web publishing to try to keep what we're calling semantic structure 
and aesthetics or style separate where possible. So sometimes people are tempted to say, I just want to hard code the style right in here um, and use inline style if you're thinking about CSS. Generally, that's bad practice because you want to have a kind of global style document which applies rules consistently and uniformly. So whenever possible, you want to apply um, classes or IDs to things. So let's say I wanted this heading to look different from the other H3s. The best way to do that would be to use this little palette button and give it a class. In HTML lingo, what a class is, is a class just means here's a repeating um, category that will always be used in a predictable way. So I might say, let's call this fun heading or whatever. So I've just wrapped this element now in a class called fun heading. And if I want this one to look the same, I simply need to say also give this the same class name. And then later, I could write a rule that says, every time you see fun heading in the book, do this, make it pink, or make it uh, a little bit, uh, I don't know, put a border around it or something like that. So, so the idea then is to say, instead of just saying, make this thing pink, make this thing pink, we give it a class and then we tell the document, every time you find an occurrence of this class, do X. So that's a general principle or general rule. Oftentimes though, it doesn't make sense to really customize your document at that granular level. It's probably just best to use the built-in defaults wherever possible. Um, another tip or advice for, yes, exactly. So Karen's, Karen's suggestion says, for example, a style guide would say, in this chapter, we've started with this overview block. If this was a general principle, then I would say when I come to my next chapter, it probably makes sense to open that one with an overview block, which means I would say, okay, I did it with the learning objectives, and then I put some text in here that said overview, and I remember the last time I made this in H1. And so then my book begins to have some rhythms and predictable patterns, and if I ever want to change these overview blocks, because I've done it consistently, I only need to change one rule, and it changes everywhere in the book, and that's the benefit of doing it in that way. Okay, um, Sunyin asks, where would you write the rules for new class? That's a great question. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna save the changes that I've made. If you want to start customizing things based on the class, you would say come to appearance, custom styles. And here what you'll see is a whole bunch of CSS rules for the web book, the ebook, and the PDF. As an example, I think what I made, so for the web book, I'm gonna say, this is writing in CSS, but I think I made something called fun heading. And so I'm gonna say that was an H3 probably. And I'll say color pink, just for fun. And I'll see if I did that right. So what I've done is I've said, here's a new rule. Every time you see something with the class fun heading, make it pink. Hopefully I did the demo right. And if I come in here, we'll notice, okay, I'm scrolling through this document. Maybe they weren't H3s, let me look, take a look. No, they were H2s, and I didn't actually apply the heading properly. So let me go back in and do it correctly. Let's say this is an H3, and I'll give it a class called unheading. And let me look at the visual to make sure. Okay, H3, I put it in a span class. Okay, so what I'll need to do is separate that slightly. Now, if I view the chapter. Okay, I turned that color pink. I targeted that class. Again, this is a little bit more advanced than most end users will need or want to do. But the principle is try to separate structure from style where possible. And these are some of the ways that Pressbooks supports that. Another accessibility tip would be when you're working in the document and you want to make, for example, a footnote. So uh, I will undo this and pretend like I hadn't done it before. So I happen to know that there's a quotation where 
somebody says that this building is considered the epitome of Byzantine architecture that changed the history of architecture. Well, that's a direct quote. I may want to provide a citation or a footnote for that. So in Pressbooks, there's a little button that says, insert a footnote. And a little pop-up will appear that says, insert your footnote content. So here's my reference. Uh, I grabbed it from Wikipedia. And it's a New York Times article by Marlies Simons. So I'm going to click OK. And you'll notice it's just made a little short code that says footnote. And here's the footnote content. If I wanted to, let's say I had this actual article, and let's pretend that's the link, I could add the actual link there as well and make the link by clicking the link button or by using my keyboard. Once I've made that footnote and saved it, what will happen when I view the chapter is Pressbooks will automatically make a little footnote here for you. It has a tooltip which will hover over if you want, or if you click on it, it's a link that will take you to the footnote at the bottom of the page which includes the text that I entered, as well as the link, and a little anchor link that will jump you back to where the footnote started from. So this here is an accessible way to make footnotes and kind of in-text content. You'll also notice that I have a glossary term that I made in this book, and you saw us make, I think you saw us make glossary terms last time, but that's a, one of the ways that you can build those kind of features in, just by using the kind of core Pressbooks tools. Um, the most important piece for thinking about accessibility for most users, though, is making sure that images and other media that are included are properly accessible. Text, generally, if text has been entered, text will be accessible for everyone, no matter what kind of thing they're using. But when you're working with images or media, that's not always true, especially for non-sighted users or people using assistive technology. So in this case, I'm writing about the Hagia Sophia. And I want an image. Uh, I don't ha I've never been there, so I haven't taken any photos. But what I did do is I went to Flickr, and I searched in Flickr for Hagia Sophia. And then I turned this filter on that said, I only want things that have a Creative Commons license, because I want to use images that I have permission to reuse. And I found this beautiful image by Christian Vario Viarios, Viaris, I don't know how to say the last name, but Viaris, Ver Viaricio, potentially. I didn't ask, but I think that might be how you say it. So here's the image. Flickr allows, and I can look and say, oh, this has a um, CCBYNCND license on it. So it means I have to give attribution, non-commercial, and I can't make derivatives, so I can't alter the image. But I'm gonna download this image, and I'll pick, let's say, the medium size of the image. I've downloaded it to my computer. I come back into Pressbooks, and I'm ready to put an image, and I wanna put it in between these two paragraphs. So I'm going to click the Add Media button, and I'm going to say Upload Files, and drag the file that I just downloaded up here. Now I have an image, but the image isn't accessible. It's not ready to use yet. The most important thing to make an image accessible is to add what's called alt text. And this is going to be a visual description for anyone for whom the image does not display, or for anyone who's requesting not to display images and see assistive technology. And so in this case, I would say, I believe it was just called the Hagia Sophia at night. That's a simple descriptive descriptor of what is in that image. I don't need to leave this as the title. Uh, I don't need a caption, but I could answer a caption. So, okay, the Hagia Sophia at night image by, what's the user's name? Let me copy that again. His name was Christian Virioso. If I wanted to, I could put that in the, the caption. I could also enter a description, which isn't really used in Pressbooks to display, but it's just for fun if you want to store that metadata. And then the other important thing is we've added this attributions field down here. And attributions is really helpful when you're using CC license images because most Creative Commons images require you to give attribution. So in this case, let's find the source URL. Well, here's the source URL. That's where I found it. So I enter it. Who's the author? I think their name was Christian Villariosio. The author's URL, well, I, he had a little page on Flickr, so I'll copy that in there. What license did they choose? It was the CCBYNCND, as many letters as possible, so I got them all in. And then I didn't adapt this image, but if I had, I could say I adapted it and how I adapted it. And then I'm gonna say, how do I want this image to appear in the text? I'm just gonna link to the file and I want it to appear uh, medium size, I put it in the chapter. So I've just inserted this image, 
along with an attribution. Um, so let's say, let's float this left. And now my image is in the book. So what I've done is I've made sure that this image had alt text and a caption, and I've also added attribution information. The attribution information doesn't display unless I tell it to display. So let me show you how to do that. If we come to appearance and theme options, there will be a number of different options that we can use that change the appearance of my book. The first one would be, let's do a two level table of contents. That means that if I've used heading ones consistently, all of the H1s will now appear as subsections in my table of contents. This is another good reason for using H1s or heading ones consistently through your book. It lets you do subsections with links in your chapter. I also want to display attributions in my chapter, and I might want to declare that this book needs to support other languages or scripts. Because I'm writing about the Hagia Sophia, I've chosen ancient Greek and Turkish, but you can see there's lots of other languages that have scripts that are non-Latin or non-Cyrillic, and so you may want to declare support for other different scripts, uh, and Pressbooks will make sure that you have the typeface files needed to render those characters in your book. Um, and then I can choose to display the chapter license and make some other choices. But those are the settings that I want to save for right now. When I've saved those settings and I go back to my book chapter, you'll then see a few things have happened. First, we'll see, okay, cool, this image appears. If I click on it, it will pop up in a little uh, display. And then at the bottom of my chapter, here's my media attribution. Title of that image by Christian Varioso. This is the copyright, and if I click on this link, it would take me to the actual image as uh, linked. Um, can you show how it looks when you add figure information to the image, along with attributions to display? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, Sunin. Um, would you help clarify it for me? Um, like uh, if you if you um, click on the image and then it pulls up the alt text um, dialog box and then there's also a section where you can add the caption information. Uh, uh, got it, got it. Okay, sure. I think I understand what you're saying now. So what we would do then is from this editing screen, there's this screen here. Once I put the image in, I can always get back by clicking edit and here are the image details. Um, so here's my alt text, here's my caption. Here's how it's been inserted in the book. And then there are some advanced things if I wanted to add a class, for example, other things like that. Or if I want to go back to the media itself, you'll notice if I come to the media library, um, here is the image with the extra information, the attribution information here. But you're asking if I went back to the figure set, I'm not sure if it was following. Oh, okay. Um, well, it, um, I guess I'll have to try it out on, on my screen, but it, it kind of looks like um, only one line of information shows up. It, I'll have to play with it. Okay. But thanks. So, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but if we, we could clarify it maybe offline or maybe in a follow-up email once you've played around with it a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions about, um, yeah, so Liz says you can put the figure number in the caption if you're numbering figures. In the future, we'd like to introduce support for automatic numbering of figures and images. Right now, it's not a su supported feature, so you have to do it manually, which is a little bit annoying, but one day we hope to do automatic figuring number, an automatic numbering of figures. Um, and let me come back to the chapter and say, was there something else that I meant to show? Oh. Um, the other thing that I would also really strongly recommend is if you're working with either audio or video, um, including either transcripts or captions. So this is a little bit extra work, but probably at your campus, there'll be an accessibility office that can give you advice or assistance. So if say, for example, you produced a podcast or an audio file, it's generally good practice to also produce a caption uh, or a transcript file that a user could access if they were hard of hearing or couldn't access the audio for some reason. I'll show you one simple example of how you could do this. So for example, we had a Portuguese language textbook that has a number of these dialogues. In this press book, you'll see, here's the dialogue. Lição 1. Um. Como é o seu nome? Just below the dialogue, we literally just printed the dialogue as a transcript. That was a very simple, very easy way to make sure that this audio file was 
accessible for non-hearing participants in the class. Um, you could also produce a text file or a document and link to it underneath that says transcript or something like that. And in the case of videos, usually you'll host the video on a, a streaming cloud provider and they will offer you the ability to upload a transcript file. I think Liz has quite a lot of experience with that. Usually professional transcriptionists will make the transcript at like a commission price or a fee and you would associate it with the video and then when the video is embedded, it will have a, C, a, a closed caption option. So let me show an example of what that might look like. So Liz has made a video here. You can see the icon on Pressbook says CC, which means we've added closed captions. So here's my video. If I were to jump ahead and turn on closed captions. I also want to note a few things about this image. Who created it? You'll see the closed caption is associated with this video and will appear in the video. All I would need to do in this case would be take that URL, come back to Pressbooks, and insert my video by pasting it on a new line. Pressbooks will then automatically embed that video, and the video had the closed caption already associated with it in YouTube, which is probably the best way to do it there. If for some reason, um, you can turn closed captions on and off using YouTube's player. If for some reason you have a different solution or it doesn't work for you or you're using something else for video, you can also insert a link below that says video transcript or provide, the, provide another means of access for differently able uh, viewers. Um, now, I covered a lot there and I just went through a big link dump, but I want to suggest there's a few more resources that I would say are really excellent if you're wanting to think about this in a, like a serious professional way. One of them is, uh, these are three resources actually that were made with Pressbooks, so it's ironic I guess that I'm sharing them, but so here's one of them. Um, it is the uh, Accessibility Toolkit from BC Campus. They made a really nice general guide to how to make accessible content, thinking about different roles at the institution. And they give some best practices for a lot of the things that I just talked about. Organizing content, images, links, tables, multimedia, etc. There's two other resources that were just published in the last month that I think are really outstanding. These were published by the uh, Chang School of Continuing Education at Ryerson University. I think they're a little bit less known than the um, BC Campus resource, but they're also really terrific. So let me drop those links in as well. One of them is just called Introduction to Web Accessibility essential accessibility for everyone and the other one is web accessibility for developers and it's a bit more like uh, technical so depending on the expertise or the interest level that various users have some of these guides might be better pitched at different levels um, again i think i'm generally safe putting in a bunch of links when i'm working with librarians because that's how librarians <laughs> um, and that's maybe where i wanted to stop and take a few more questions if Anybody has them? Otherwise, I'll hand it over to Liz. Okay, maybe we'll allow a little time for questions at the end as well. Okay. I went a little over time. Sorry, Liz. Oh, no worries. Um, so for my part, again, keeping with our theme of best practices when creating content in Pressbooks, I'm just going to fly over a few features that are fairly relevant to that conversation. The first is talking about metadata, and there are several levels at which you can enter metadata in Pressbooks. Steele has demonstrated some of those for images. Another um, that I'm going to demonstrate here is your book information page. And this is where you would enter information like your title, like uh, different uh, things about the book perhaps you want to indicate the university as the publisher or yourself as the publisher, uh, the date of publication, things like ISBNs if you have those, uh, DOIs if you have those for the book. Again, um, you can also indicate the link to the book. Um, I'll talk about this in just a moment. Uh, the copyright holder, a very important notion. Uh, and then you also, most importantly, want to be picking a license here. Uh, this is really important because this tells Pressbooks whether or not a book can be cloned by other parties who are trying to remix content uh, for their students, for their users. Um, so this is one of the most important cho uh, choices you'll make about the book. Um, other important choices, though, are the ability to attribute all of 
producers on your book. One thing we found at Pressbooks is that there was a need originally a long time ago, many years ago, this just had the choice of authors. Um, and you just that was all you could enter and it became a little bit confusing. Now we have a way to credit all different types of contributors from authors, to your editors, to the people who may have translated a book, review the book under peer review, illustrated things, or contributed in other ways we may not have anticipated. And there's a couple ways you can credit uh, these. If they are already in this book in Pressbooks, you can uh, find them from the dropdown. So I could, uh, for instance, credit a faculty colleague who's been working on this book in here. I can also create new contributors from this screen. Uh, so if I wanted to add a contributor, they do not actually need to have access to Pressbooks at all or to this book. Um, so I can just add their name uh, and then, again, making up a name here, I can add them as a new contributor. I think that one already exists in the book, Liz. Oh, again? Okay. Uh, but you get the idea. Okay, yeah. You get the idea. Um, so, uh, work. <laughs> okay, new faculty. Um, so, regardless, second faculty, there it's shown up. So, when I go back to Books and Co, now I can credit that contributor. Uh, so, here we have our existing ones and then this new one that I have added. Uh, I can add them and save that with the rest of the metadata. Another thing you can do with the book info page is actually upload the cover that you want to be part of the web book, as well as part of the, uh, as well as part of the ebook. So when you have an ebook, the cover is typically included inside the ebook. That is very different from a print on demand file where the interior file is the interior and does not include the cover as well. And what you upload on this page is actually going to be the thing that goes into those two pages. I will say Pressbooks is somewhat finicky about the aspect ratio and the dimensions for that image. So I have an image that I pre-prepared uh, sitting on my desktop and uh, you basically need to follow uh, the directions for particular dimensions uh, and also the file size as well. And then when you save, that image will typically upload. Um, and then that image is the image. Here we go. I'm finding a press book here. Cleared all my cookies uh, and probably shouldn't have. But here we go. So this book cover, this is what I'm uploading on that book info metadata page. Um, so it says that that book information has been updated. So I believe that uploaded successfully. Um, another really great thing that you can do on a given book and again, let's go back to this book. If you go into an individual chapter, you may have an instance where a faculty member has simply contributed to one chapter, or perhaps you've pulled one chapter uh, from an open resource and it has a certain author that you want to credit, but you don't really want to credit them as like a book author um, because they were in no way involved in the other, you know, 30 chapters of the book. What you can do is you can go to an individual chapter and you have an opportunity to enter uh, the author as well as other metadata at the chapter level as well. So here at the chapter level, uh, you can do a variety of things. You could customize the short title and subtitle, but what we're what is most exciting here, I think, is that ability to credit a faculty member or an author of some kind or a contributor um, who has been involved simply on that chapter if you need to do that. Again, from the screen, you can create a new contributor if they don't already exist in this book. And again, on this page, you have the power, for instance, um, you may have a chapter that has a different license from the rest of your book. And so you've licensed the book predominantly under one Creative Commons license, let's say, but there's one chapter that is licensed differently and you need to find a way to essentially indicate that. So here, um, I might uh, select a different license for this chapter um, and then in addition, I might actually have a different DOI at this chapter level as well. And if I do, I could indicate that here as well. So again, anytime you're entering the metadata, you would just save that. 
Um, another concept I wanted to talk about is sort of the export formats and what those are best for um, and why you would use certain formats in certain contexts. So you have this choice of about a dozen different ways to export the file. And you know, I personally would recommend exporting in as many of these as you're willing to export in because you never know um, why someone might need a different modality or they may have a use case you haven't anticipated. Um, and so I personally really love the notion of making as many exports, all of them if you can, essentially available on the webbook homepage. Um, but if you may or may not want to do that, and just for a rundown of what each of these is intended for, um, the PDF for print is in a way where it's going to meet specifications of print on demand providers. The most common um, of those being Ingram Spark, uh, Lulu. Um, you could also utilize that PDF for print for your bookstore to make a course reader or to make you know, a printed copy of this, this book. Um, the PDF for digital distribution is typically a good thing. Like if you need to email a PDF to someone, that's a better one to export because it will compress the images. It will also remove, if you have extra pages so that the book always, each chapter is starting on the right page, it will remove those extra pages. And again, you'll have sort of a smaller file that's a little more manageable. Um, I should mention that both of our PDFs are tagged PDFs, which means they have a document structure applied. And that is important. All of our exports have that, um, but this is particularly important because not all PDFs have that. Um, and the PDFs that you're producing on Pressbooks will have that. Um, so again, if you've made that nice structure that Steele has recommended through your, your book, that will um, show up uh, and manifest in the PDFs. EPUB is a pretty universal format for various e-readers. Um, tablets, etc. The Mobi is particularly a format that you might use to put the book on Amazon for sale. Um, EPUB 3 is a different flavor of the ebook. And then these XH, XHTML, HTML book, open document, Pressbooks XML, and WordPress XML are fairly open formats. And these are really designed to make the book more useful to people who may want to one day remix it, but don't have access to a Pressbooks network. This ensures that the book is not locked up in a proprietary format that is only useful to users. So we care very much that you can both get content in, as Steele demonstrated earlier, but that you can also get content back out for yourself and that others can get that content out of you. Hey, Liz, Karen has her hand up there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Liz, um, I think your mic maybe got knocked. It's, it's just a little garbled, so I just wanted oh, to. Oh, no. That's, that's better. OK. Do I need to repeat it, anything, or was the basic sense? I, OK. Uh, I think it's okay. I see people nodding. Okay. Um, super. Sorry about that. Um, one last thing I, or maybe one or two last things I will show. Um, so these common cartridge links are for, um, essentially you would export these files and take them into your learning management file. And I'm not going to demonstrate how you would do that right now, but I will conceptually explain the web links. Um, is nice if you want to sort of outlay like each chapter in your learning management system and sort of call your students special attention to make sure that they you know proceed sequentially through all of the content just and don't just go to say the web book link and read like the first chapter or something like that it's a way to call attention to the various chapters in the lms um the lti links version of this goes a little deeper it allows you to to do that, but to do it in a way that's much more seamless in the LMS so that the learner really thinks they're still in the LMS, they're not really aware, they're looking at anything that wasn't created in the LMS. Um, and if you need to, for instance, deliver uh, private content on Pressbooks, perhaps if you're making a course reader from copyrighted materials that you have permission to show only in that, that wall garden of the LMS, you can do that with the LTI links integration. And that's really one of the big use cases you would use that for. Another reason you might want that is if you are making frequent changes to the book on Pressbooks, those will then instantly sync in the learning system. So those are some reasons you might use that. And then I'll quickly show the cover generator, which is a nice way to get a very simple, generic cover without having to hire or bother your graphic designer on staff to do the sort of InDesign process that would 
typically be required to get a document at exactly the right size. When you do print on demand, the size requirements depend on things like the page count, uh, the trim size of the book, the um, number of pages, which affects uh, the spine of this cover, which is included front, back, spine. Um, it's a very difficult size to work in, and just knowing all of that and bleeds and all that sort of a thing. Our cover generator will help you generate that without knowing what it is, basically which is so the way to use this and you can use it in lots of ways like you could type in your title here you could type in your spine title you could type in your authors you could type in the authors for the spine you could put basically the back cover information under the about section add your ISBN which will generate the barcode for you uh, and then you could do something like for instance um, indicate your page count, your type of paper, and then you could choose some colors. So you might say, well, let's just make this a simple red cover. Um, and maybe you'll choose the exact same color for, you know, the back cover and just make them all match, essentially. You could even indicate a particular hex color that you want to use to make it a little more original. Um, and then you could choose, you know, the spine text colors, etc. And then when you make a PDF color, you would basically have like a plain blank cover. I typically go one step further and I create an image, which I'll now delete, but I create an image in a tool um, that I call, Cam that is called Canva. And what I did in this particular image is I found this main image on Flickr. It was CC by license. Um, and essentially, so it was usable as the front cover. And then in Canva, using their uh, paid version, they have a tool where you can easily resize the image to the right size. And this saves me the, the hassle of um, working in something like Photoshop, which can also be very expensive. It's something like $34 a month. Um, and so I always try for something a little easier. And so what I can do to this now is I can essentially resize this by clicking resize and then indicate the size that I want to resize this to. And again, for the cover generator, it can be a little picky about the dimensions. Um, in this case, I believe this is the size um, and aspect ratio. So Canva is going to help me copy and resize this image. I'm going to download a compressed PNG of this uh, when I'm ready. In Canva, in order to do this, I believe I did have to pay like $11, but again, much better than what I would have had to pay. Um, download that image, and then a couple minutes later, you have an image that you can upload into that cover generator. I think I was working on here. And so I've already downloaded that image um, earlier today, so I'm going to select that again out of this uh, folder. I did have to do a little math to get the correct um, size and aspect ratio, but again, worth it if this helps you bypass the process of either self-design or someone else going through an arduous process to design something that includes the front line and cover. And then I will um, select this when it finishes uploading. Um, one little trick, if you do use a real image that actually has the name of the book and the author already for the front cover, you're going to want to use um, some code to hide what would otherwise be um, the title of the book in the cover generator. Um, so as soon as this uploads, I'm going to say select. Okay, there we go. And then I have a little piece of code here that I often end up looking up on the internet. And what I'm gonna do is where the title would be on the front cover, I'm going to copy and paste this. And then where you know authors might be on the front cover, I'm going to copy and paste that. And then I'm going to select make PDF cover. If anyone's curious about the code that Liz just pasted, it's the HTML code for a non-breaking space. So it's just saying, put a blank space instead of actual text. So that's what she just did. 
And then when you go to upload your um, file to print on demand, you're just going to download this PDF cover. Um, and again, like this is a mock-up of this. This is not any cover you would make under realistic circumstances. But if you took, you know, maybe an, you know, half an hour to play around with this, you could get something that is usable and that passes the difficult requirements um, without much effort. So with that, I'm going to stop. I know we have to leave some time for questions. sharing. There were some questions that were asked in the chat earlier, Liz. I tried to provide answers, but I will just read them out loud just in case you had different responses and in case people weren't monitoring the chat. So one of them was, um, Katie asked, are there any downsides to allowing all export options? I said, not really, except that just know that an export is a fixed frozen version of your book at a given point in time. If you're making lots of edits and revisions, just remember you're going to have to make exports again after they're done. Anything else you'd add to that, Liz? On some of my books, I make the exports every semester and I try to leave it stable in between so that the exports are the same as what's on the web book. Um, the other thing I would say is that just remember that those open formats can be remixed. So if you, hopefully you're intending to do that with the open content you're creating, but if you're not, you might not want to do that. Okay, and then there was another question. Sunin asked, what are the what common cartridge link works best with Sakai or are they standard to all LMSs? The answer that I said was uh, the, the, the idea of a common cartridge as a specification is meant to be common to all LMSs. So the, the common cartridge with web links, I, we believe is universal for all LMSs. Different LMSs with the LTI links may be slightly different. We haven't, I haven't tested in the last couple months. So um, you could ask for deeper advice from us when you get to that point. But generally, I think Sakai works with all of them. Sakai is pretty good at standards. They're an open LMS, and they care a lot about standards. And um, then Amanda asked, what does the cover generator look like if you don't upload a custom image? So that's a little bit up to you. Um, you could spend about 15 minutes, and you could um, basically add the information. It would contain basically like your title if you enter that, your authors if you enter that, the blurb that would be on the back of the book in about if you enter that, a spine title and spine author if you enter that, and then you could customize the colors of the front, the spine, and the back. What I would suggest in this instance is that you pick relatively the same colors for those three areas and that you choose like something that looks good for the color of the text that is showing up. It would just be like basically text on a color. You yeah. can choose the text, you can choose the color, and you could choose, I believe to some degree, you have a little tiny bit of control over like maybe five, it's five fonts. Where there's like, yeah, there's like a little bit of choice in the typeface, but not much. But basically it's a solid color with text on top of it in a pretty consistent way. Okay, another question came in. Um, I have an author who's been struggling with the LaTeX plugin. Is there a resource we could turn to if needed? Yes, great question. So LaTeX, for people who don't know, uh, LaTeX or LaTeX is um, mathematical notation. So it's a way to write math um, in the browser. And so there's a couple different ways that math can be handled. And this gets very complicated, so we can't answer it all in two minutes. But I will point you to our guide chapter. Um, let me pull it up. Um, uh, Pressbooks guide. Okay, there's a chapter called Math in Pressbooks, and this is probably, in my view, the longest, most complicated chapter in our guide. But there's the link. There's, there's the short answer is there's a couple of different ways to represent math. Um, we have on our Pressbooks hosted network, we built a solution that's native to Pressbooks that displays it using uh, MathJax which is uh, accessible math across all browsers using JavaScript. Um, if you're using a self-hosted network, you have to install a microservice that does this. It's a little bit complicated, but we have instructions for doing it if you're an open source user. But all of our hosted networks use MathJax by default. There's also an option to use something called WP Quick LaTeX, and that's a different way of representing math. Um, it, the, the, there's a couple of small advantages to LaTeX and then some drawbacks. The advantages to using the LaTeX plugin are if you need to declare extra packages uh, in LaTeX that aren't included in the base configuration for MathJax, you can. Like some people want to do these 3D 
graphs, and so you need a separate package declared. The downside of using that plugin is all of the math will be rendered as uh, PNG or SVG images with alt text. So it's good in that it's mildly accessible, but the MathJax solution native in browser is generally better and more accessible, and it's just a nicer experience for most math users. But so generally, we'd say use the the native MathJax version, and only go to the plugin if it's a very special use case. That's the I tried to give that answer in thirty seconds or less, but. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steele, and thank you, Liz, and thank you, everyone, for your questions and engagement in the chat. I dropped our Pressbooks unit link in there, as well as YouTube videos. As a reminder, you can go to the bottom right-hand corner of your chat screen and where you see those three dots, you can click Save Chat so that you have access to all of the links that um, Liz and Steele have been sharing. So uh, that's it for today. Look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for our third and final meeting when we will focus on adding interactivity and using plugins in Pressbooks. So thanks again, everyone. Hope you have a good week between now and then. Bye.